This show is made possible by the generous support of listeners just like you. Our show is about helping souls grow, prosper, and evolve. And every gift ensures that we can continue to do this. So we thank our generous supporters and also ask if you would like to be a part of supporting this important effort to bring this message of truth to the world. Please consider heading to experienceofthesoul.com slash support to be a part of supporting us by being a regular patron or making a one-time gift. Blessings on the journey, dear friend. Zen Living Realty, Support Tech Staffing, and Center for the Healing Arts present The Authentic Spiritual Journey, a weekly show featuring real and practical spiritual conversations from diverse perspectives here on the Experience of the Soul podcast channel. Today, episode 144, The Observer Self. And now your host, Reverend Cynthia Alice Anderson. Hello and welcome to The Authentic Spiritual Journey. My name is Cynthia Alice Anderson, lovingly known as RCA, <laughs> and I am the host. And I'm here in, in 818 Studios with my producer. Hello, everybody. This is Dave Croft. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 144 of The Authentic Spiritual Journey. I hope that you've had an amazing weekend and we're going to have a fantastic week. Spring is here. It's springtime in Florida and my car is so yellow right now. <laughs> Even though I, know, I don't have love a yellow spring car, in Florida. I but uh, but yeah, oh, I love spring in Florida. Yes, I do too. Beautiful, beautiful days, beautiful weather. I've been out doing some walks with my dog and going to several different parks and areas. Oh, it's been so beautiful. If where you are, you can get out. We highly encourage connection with God through nature and just feeling the sun on your face. Especially if you've been, you know, snowed in, if you, mm -hmm. you know, when the sun comes out and you can step out, that sun on your face is like, man, it's like healing balm for the soul, man. Absolutely. It's so important. Yeah, especially coming after a pretty brutal winter, even for Florida standards, it was pretty, pretty brutal. And uh, obviously with uh, with all the, the ice and the storms in Texas and everything else, our hearts yes. absolutely go out to uh, our Texas listeners. But I hope that with the, uh, the verdant greenery that is hopefully already starting to show up around you. Um, I hope that you are going to have an amazing springtime. Well, and springtime, of course, is all about new life, new energy. And, you know, we're always about that. We're always about that. And today I'm going to talk about something that I haven't talked about in depth maybe ever. And it's something I'm really working with and have been for a long, long time. Uh, I first learned about it about 25 years ago, probably. Dave, give our title for today, if you will. The title for today's show is The Observer Self. The Observer the Self. The Observer Self. Yes, The Observer Self. Dave, is this something you've heard talked about spiritually very uh, often? No, I'm not familiar with this term. Yeah. Well, it's more of a term that you might hear from the Eastern religions, and I learned about it uh, once again through Jane Elizabeth Hart. You know, so much of, of my ministry is based on so much that I learned from her. We And we still connect often. She's in her late 80s now and still a gift in my life. And this teaching was such a gift to me because it helped me become an observer of my life. So it's called the observer self. And, uh, and it's called that for a reason. But before I get into that, I want to just share a quote with you that really sums up so much of the work we do here, and it's by Socrates, and it is this, the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living, which to me says it's important to examine life, to examine our part in it, our place in it, and also how uh, there is a potential in each one of us to grow, to evolve, to uh, become a blessing, and yes, to receive uh, said blessings as well. And, you know, I know from talking to so many of you that listen to the show, you are deep in your journey, and you want to make a difference, and you see yourself as important to the whole. Well, we need tools for how to do that. You know, it's not just about believing that there is God. It's not even about just believing God is within it's not even about believing that we have an infinite self, although all those things are important. 
If we don't become an observer of our own selves and our own behaviors and our own emotions, growth becomes very, very difficult because we, most of us, are ruled by our emotion or our emotive nature. You know, how we feel decides what we do and how we respond or rather <laughs> react, <laughs> right? We've, we've, uh, you know, we often see things played out on the political stage this way. We see it in our own lives. If somebody says or does something we don't like, we immediately have an emotional reaction. And this is normal. This is part of the great human experience that we're having. But what I've learned is that if we react from those emotions and we act out of that initial feeling that in truth, we're acting from more of our uh, lower nature, a base nature of being, rather than our higher self. So when I say the observer self, what I'm really meaning is um, it's almost like a spiritual muscle of the higher self. It's like you are learning to observe life from a higher perspective and observe even yourself. And I've said in some of the past shows, I think that you know, as you begin to grow and as you begin to evolve, you know, the hard thing is you start to see places where uh, you start to really be in touch with your limited self. You see how your beliefs are no longer working. You see how uh, these modes that you get into, if you get uh, triggered, are no longer working, but you don't have new ones yet and you don't know how to get out of it. And I think as humans, we can all relate to this dynamic. And, you know, what we often see reported on in the news and we see it played out politically, as I mentioned, you know, is this reactive nature. So we all falsely assume that this is just the way life is, that we have to, you know, if I'm mad, it means there's somebody to blame when, in fact, we may just be feeling angry. Or if I'm mad, there must be somebody to hurt or take it out on. And in fact, I just may be feeling scared or angry. So the observer self uh, helps us like move into this place of awareness about what's happening, happening with us on the emotional level. So it also helps like make really good um, everyday decisions. So it's like, this is not some like such high spiritual teaching, you know, you have to have studied spirituality for 50 years to understand it. Uh, it's why, you know, many of us are on a therapeutic journey with our therapist, because if we can't see our own selves, then we like go to somebody else to help us see, right, some of our behaviors and the things we're doing that are contrary to what we say we want to be. And we say, you know, we want to do. So I hope, Dave, is this making sense yeah. since it's yeah, New absolutely. to you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's for most of us, uh, and and I will say myself included, when I first heard about it, I didn't realize how so much of my life was on automatic. I did the same things, I had the same behaviors. And and uh even recently I, I noticed a pattern in myself that I'm saying, wow, this is really old and this is not serving me anymore. And it was only because I could finally see my part, myself, and how I was um, really sabotaging a situation. And it wasn't until I could get some space from it and get out of the, you know, emotive response of why did this happen, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it was when I could like be quiet and breathe and listen to the inner voice. And then I started journaling down, like, what happened? I started writing down what happened. And um, as a part of my training, uh, I mentioned this months ago, as a part of my training, I did what's called uh, uh, the CPE program, which is becoming a chaplain in a hospital setting. And I worked in long-term care. I worked in ICU. I worked in cancer units. And one of the skills we learned was to write what's called a verbatim. And in a verbatim, what you do is you, uh, you know, have a visit with a patient and then you, you type out or write out all the, all of the dialogue and then you share it with the class. 
And it's so vulnerable because basically uh, the whole class goes, well, here you did this and here you did this. <laughs> so and here you did this. It's like, picking if you, you don't want to, yeah, if you don't want to grow, I would say don't go to chaplaincy uh, <laughs> uh, training. Um, it was like, you know, it, it felt a little bit like being in a rock tumbler and like maybe when I got out, I was a little shinier, <laughs> but you know, but it was pretty brutal uh, going through it. Um, and and so what I learned to do is uh, uh, look at situations, look at conversations from a higher perspective. And it was having others, you know, reflect for me what I did not see in myself. So not everybody has that, right? So at this about about a year after I started learning about the observer observer self, then I went through that training, and it was like, oh, here it is again. So there are parts of my life and parts of my behavior I cannot see. And, of course, I still have those parts. We all do. It's called being human on planet Earth, friends. So don't hear me say, uh, uh, I've got this all worked out. Um, but what I do have is a regular practice of moving into observing my thoughts, my actions, you know, my behaviors. So this is very, very helpful. What, when we can move, well, let me say, when we can move out of the reaction mode and we can like observe the feelings and feel them, we can then, you know, decide what the proper response is. See this, even saying this, I hope you're hearing how this brings a lot of freedom. Instead of being controlled by your emotions, it's almost like you watch them go by. And uh, I um, recently, I mean, a real <laughs> practical way I've been working with this, and Dave knows because I called him a couple times super frustrated <laughs> on some tech stuff, and I'm like, can you please help me right now? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's, sure, it's all good. All yeah, good. Text, exactly, exactly. Text stuff doesn't send me into fits of rage. Right. Well, Much. what was interesting <laughs> as I got, I didn't tell you this, Dave, as I, as I got off the call and I was like, you know, that was so easy. Why do I get so frustrated with myself. So, so hear this friend. So I was like, <laughs> and, and it was like, I had a number of things in over a couple of several days. Uh, you know, this new computer, new camera wasn't working right. And then I got the camera hooked up and then something else wasn't working right. You know, and, um, I still have one thing I have to figure out, but, um, but I thought, why am I getting so cranked out of shape? I have all the support I need. Uh, Dave is happy to help. I can call the company if I, you know, if it gets to that point, I'll, you know, go on the chat, which now I'm very well versed in doing on, on, uh, on the digital sites. I'm learning that's just what you do. You go and you sit in the chat and you wait yep. to talk to a professional. But what I was looking at, so there were several things. One was, what was my initial frustration and then why was I staying there, hmm. you know, in my response? Because it was like, then every other tech thing that happened kind of piled on the last one. And it was like the world is out to get me. You know, we start to personalize everything that's happening. And so it was like, okay, so let's think about this. This is a new machine, so it's new to me. So one of the things I observed in myself is I have this lie I tell myself that I should know before I have the information. So it's a way I self-abuse. Do you hear that, friends? Do you hear that? That somehow I have the false belief that I should know before I've ever read or been taught or anything. Now that, I mean, just hear that. Hear how, hear how uh, unrealistic that is. I, I think... He, I think that's a trait that happens to a lot of leaders. I, I think because yes. so frequently people look to them for mm -hmm. answers and for guidance that mm -hmm. you just kind of get in, in the mood, or not in the mood, but in the mode rather, of having answers because you do have a lot of answers and a lot of people kind of are, are, are following you. And so then when it comes to yourself and things that, that uh, you might not have the answers, you, you expect yourself to already know. Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. if it's something as as uh, as routine as 
using a camera on a computer, which is very routine now. And so, yes, when- it is. Well, and especially because with my built in camera, I didn't have to do anything or choose any new camera. And what was so funny, I had a little growth in the area because uh, then, uh, just recently, I was doing this five-week workshop for Unity of New York, which was just a really great blessing in my life, and it was a lot of fun. Well, once the new camera had worked great, and then I had to get online with them on their Zoom, and all of a sudden, it was not even reading my camera. It, my camera did not exist, and my other camera, course, is covered up, so all they were seeing is static. And I said, you know what? Give me about five minutes. I said, I am learning to not get upset, to plug, to unplug, to restart if need be. I said, so I'm going to go off this call. Just give me a second. And I was totally calm, and I came back on, and it worked perfectly. And all I did was move off. I gave myself time. And so that was the other thing, is this pressure to I put on myself that has to be immediate. You know, it's like, okay, right now, you've got to figure it out. You've got to do it. You've got a deadline. When I can just say, you know what, uh, I need a minute. Yeah, and there and, and so, that that kind of especially now when we're going live, and yes. it's it's got to be you know, like there are lights and a camera and and yes. all this other stuff, and it can mm-hmm. be really intense. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I guess it would have been about a month ago now. Um, you know, we were doing the uh, CCU Orlando uh, business meeting, and we were live streaming it. So for the first time, we're live streaming it to right. YouTube, to Facebook, and we have a concurrent. Zoom session so that church members can vote and all this stuff. And of course, something went sideways and the audio was being weird. And and that could be that's like a crucible of pressure. All <laughs> all it is all converging right at, at, at the same moment. time. And it can be really super stressful. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, um, we're ta- we're relating this, friends, to modern day tasks that we all have to do, and so what what I'm what I hope you're hearing is it's not about the task; it's what it's our response to something not working, and then we show what we're we're showing and seeing ourselves in the response, and it's like, okay, I really want to grow out of this pattern because it isn't fun. You know, it feels like I'm getting beat up. You know, I always call this our internal assault. <laughs> it feels like I'm getting beat up from the inside when already something's not working. So I'm already frustrated. Let's hurt ourselves some more. Mm. And so um, just seeing the behavior then gives me a lot of freedom because then um, in a situation that seems and felt in the past out of my control, you know, suddenly uh, I'm able to respond differently. And that gives me great, great freedom. And it also puts me in a power position. So instead of being controlled by my emotions, it's like, you know, wow, how do I want to respond to this? There's and, a, you know, uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I didn't, there, there's, there's a scene in Scrubs, uh, the show that was on like early 2000s. And um, one of the characters is really bad at crashes, like when, um, you know, when somebody codes. Oh, and, and, and so like everything is yeah. going crazy. And uh, one character is really bad and asks, how do you, and the other character is really good at, at handling codes. And it's right. like, how do you handle this? Well, there's so many decisions being made. And, uh, and she says, I just, I stop. I take a big, deep breath, no matter what's happening, a big, deep breath and kind of pull out of, out of the moment, out of yourself. Mm-hmm. And this is that mm-hmm. observer self. Yes. And then suddenly things start kind of falling into place. And that's what sounds like it happened with you with the the unity of New York. You just kind of, I'm going to take a breath, take a step back, allow things to start to align so that I can have a clear picture. Because if I try to do all this solve problem solving in the right. midst of chaos, then you're not going to chaos your way out of that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, doctors really are trained to do that because they're always looking at patterns anyway. Mm -hmm. So they have to come out of themselves. And as as a minister and as I do, you know, some counseling and and some various coaching things, uh, that's exactly what I'm doing as well. So the good news is for my for my career, you know, it really helps. But just think if you're in banking and you're sitting there talking to a client and the client says something that triggers you or behaves in a way that you don't like. Imagine how this could serve your soul and theirs because, you know, you still want them to get their 
uh, their banking needs taken care of. You still want to be able to serve them. And so what if you could, you know, rise above whatever was happening in that situation and start to observe it as if, you know, you're observing even someone else's life and work and, and, and behaviors. So this is, um, this can be very, very helpful in everyday life. And hear me when I say the reason we do it is so we have more freedom to live life and make good choices, uh, especially when dealing with our emotions. So we're going to talk more about this. I'm going to share kind of a funny way. I dealt with it very recently, making a purchase. And we'll be right back right after these brief messages. Thank you, friends. We'll return to the program in just a few moments. But first, we wanted to give a special word of thanks to our podcast partner, Zen Living Realty. Zen Living Realty's mission is to mindfully serve, connect, and positively impact their customers, partners, and community through their Zen approach to real estate. Their vision is to be the most trusted real estate brokerage in the Central Florida area. You can reach Zen Living Realty at zenlivingrealty.com or call 407-800-2717. We'd also like to give a special word of thanks to Support Tech Staffing, Support Tech Staffing is an innovative staffing agency built on the principle of caring about employers and employees as they navigate these new workforce and workplace challenges. If you're an employer, they want to be your human resource partner and help with the changes needed during the pandemic. If you're a candidate, they want to become your lifelong career agent to help you grow into your fullest potential. Support Tech prioritizes support over volume, integrity over profits, and will treat your business and your career as if it was their own. You can learn more at supporttechstaffing.com. That's S-U-P-P-O-R-T-E-K staffing.com. And finally, we want to give a special word of thanks to Center for the Healing Arts. Center for the Healing Arts is one of the first dedicated group practices devoted to challenging, supportive, and nurturing therapy. Their dedicated therapists have a wide range of expertise, including relationship and couples therapy, individual therapy, addictions, neurofeedback, play therapy for children, adolescents, and families, and therapy for blended family issues. They also regularly offer day-long intensive workshops for relationships, addiction recovery, adult children of alcoholics, and healing trauma in the LGBTQ plus community. For more information, head over to centerforthehealingarts.com or call 407-657-8555, extension 1. We now return you to this week's episode of The Authentic Spiritual Journey with your host, Rev. Cynthia Alice Anderson. Welcome back. We're glad you're with us. Well, I realized um, we got so into the uh, everyday way to apply it. I want to back up a little bit because I want to make sure that you hear that um, you know, working your observer self is a way to keep the personality self or the ego self in check, you know, and not having it run rampant in your life. And it's so, so important to be able to observe not only your behaviors and your emotions, but even your thoughts about a situation. Um, so one clear way to practice, so I haven't really given you some steps and I want to, one clear way to practice is, uh, you know, like, um, as you go throughout your day, have some visual thing, you know, be a, a cue like, okay, I'm going down the road and I hit a red light. I'm going to say, what am I thinking right now? You know, or I'm going to set a timer at lunch and I'm going to say, uh, every time that timer goes off every two hours or every three hours or whatever I set, I'm going to say, what am I thinking right now? Because it's, it's, it's like any muscle uh, that you begin to use at first, it's a little clunky, you know, and even it feels kind of hard, but once you get used to it, you're, you will find that you're in the observer self a lot. And this is really where we want to be. Um, virtually every, uh, capable leader I know is nearly constantly in the observer self because they realize that their words and their actions are impacting a great number of people. Um, so, so the observer self, uh, uh, first of all, you want to have some outward cues. You can set an alarm. You could say, every time I see a red light, if I'm out driving, 
You can say at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm going to think about this. And the thing you're doing is, again, creating this new muscle, creating a new habit so that you can become more self-aware. And and remember, as you become more self-aware, you're having more freedom in your life and in your responses because you don't want to say things that then you have to go back and clean up. You don't want to do things that you're going to regret later. So you learn as you're observing yourself, as you're setting this timer every day, when you're feeling this emotion, you're learning to just have these pass through your mind without engaging the feeling like something has to be done because I feel it. Um, and, and sometimes as you, as you get like more in depth in watching this, you will see too how your emotions are trying to push you into a certain action. Your emotions will want to push you to fight for something, to, to have your way. And, you know, anytime you're saying to yourself, I'm going to show them, (laughs) watch out. You are in the personality and the ego. You're like flaming, you know, (laughs) it's like flaming ego. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's put the fire out here. And, uh, also, you know, as you start to observe, you 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 want to stop these thoughts, like negative thoughts in your consciousness. And that's that was what I was meaning earlier about like what what is going on with me that I'm this frustrated, you know, like all these times. And and as I'm as I'm sharing this today, um, what I can see is that this is how the divine order of the universe works. See, all those things happened, it was like a divine setup. For me to get that. Number one, to know I don't have to know it all because who can? And and number two, it is okay to seek help. And number three, it is okay to not know everything before I've been taught it or read it or studied it. I mean, it's like kind of impossible. See, so um, when I was seeing the negativity I was giving myself, it's like, I don't want that to go any further in my consciousness. Because the worse I feel, then I'm going to start making dumb choices. And I'm going to reach for chips and I'm going to reach for sugar. I'm going to do those two things. Salt, fat, and sugar. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Maybe even something fried to top it all off. You throw it on the pile. Yes. Because somehow I have to feel better. And all those things give us like little bursts of energy. Yep. And uh, I had a therapist tell me one time that sugar is mama. Every time we reach for sugar, <laughs> what we're really wanting is, you know, security and love. So think about this, friends. Uh, just, you know, how conscious have you been? Have you been at the last hour, two hours of your life? And you'll see we just go on automatic. So think about this. How can you begin to become more aware? One is, yes, set an alarm, uh, something in the outer as you see it or as you do it. Uh, Let that be, uh, you know, a sign to you like, oh, what am I thinking right now? The other thing as you uh, start to become more aware and more active in this process is you want to start journaling uh, what you notice each day. You know, so there is an action step to this, not just thinking about it, but sometimes you know, at the end of the day, you just want to say, well, how did today go in observing my emotions? <laughs> and you're, some days you're going to go, I didn't do it at all. <laughs> and then other days you're going to go, oh, you know what? I am growing. I am learning. I am able to not attach to every emotion I feel. You know, I am able to, you know, stop this um, inner negativity, you know, that wants to happen. And What you'll find as you grow is you begin to grow out of what we've called our comfort zone, you know, where we think we know everything, where we have this, these certain things that always happen and we always have the same reactions. To grow, to prosper, to evolve, we have to have new reactions to old situations. And that's what being the observer self helps with. You become conscious of what you do and even why you do it. So the observer self, working with the observer self is really a key to your spiritual and emotional freedom. Yes, it's very, very important. I'm going to say that again. So as you learn to be an observer and as you, you know, contact daily the observer self, 
you become conscious of what you do and why you do it. And this is a huge key to emotional freedom. So some of the positive aspects of working with this, I mean, it's all positive, but what I've talked about so far is things that are difficult to see. Well, there's also a lot of positives, and this is a funny one to share because it just happened earlier today. And um, I have had, uh, when I go buy shoes, I buy them in this certain place in Orlando because, uh, and I'll, I'll lift up the store because it's a really great store. It's called Track Shack, and all they sell is is like running shoes. It is a running store and it's in this cool old building and they've been there forever. And the people know a lot about your feet. They know about like what you need and everything in your, you know, they help you get the right thing for your feet. Well, um, several years ago I had an issue and they helped me find the right shoe that was more comfortable for me. And then I went in today and not only did I get help, I found, I, uh, I found out a new way to lace my shoes. Now, this is funny. I hope this is not Snoresville for you. <laughs> but I've learned that a way to uh, I'm not beat up on myself if I don't know something is just to get curious. And, uh, for instance, I had this pair of shoes that wasn't working. And I, I was like, is it my foot? Is it the shoe wrong or whatever? And so I took it in and I said to the guy, you know, these are great shoes. But somehow it's not working well, and I don't know if I need new shoes or whatever. And he goes, well, look how I do mine. And suddenly, like, there was this whole new little world about uh, there was a lot of different ways to lace it so that your foot is comfortable and yet supported. And everybody's feet are different, you know, and all this. So I got, like, such a lesson. I was, like, so happy to learn it all. It's, like, weird, right? There, there's more than one way to lace up shoes. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, this certain part of the shoe that was the tennis shoe that I felt was too tight. And one of the ways is to simply skip that 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 first loop that's, like, closest to the toe. Don't put the, don't put the lace in there. You just put it in the next hole. And it's, like, all of a sudden my foot had all this room. I didn't, I didn't know you could— like a, yeah. I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could exactly. skip holes. <laughs> yeah. And the guy was like, oh, a lot of people have to do this. And I said, well, you know, my mom was a marathoner, triathloner. And I remember she had a different way uh, of of tying at the top because she had this area across her foot. And so um, so anyway, for, so first it was that. And that was great because I had no reaction. I was happy to learn the information. Well, then I was noticing I kept going to this other shoe I'd never seen there before. And I was going to buy what I had bought before. And he even had gotten the shoes out for me. And I said, I don't know what it is. I want to see the shoe. And um, and he said, well, let me tell you about it. So he told me all this information. And and he said, let me just get one to try it on. You may not like this color. We can order you something or, or whatever. There's a couple different colors available. So anyway, he went and got it. And he put it on right away. I said, this is it. This is my shoe. I'm not taking it off. I'm wearing these out. And uh, we just had a great laugh about it. And But what was so great, the reason I did that is because I kept noticing, I kept going over to the shoe, even though I actually came to buy something specific, something I had bought before, something that has always worked. But somehow over the last several months, I'd been having an issue with this area of my ankle and I was being guided like, you know, unconsciously over to this other areas. So because I listened, because I was observing myself, it was like, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to check this out. And see, normally I'm in, I get the shoe, I try it on and I'm out. I don't take a lot of time to um, shop. And so it felt like tremendous self-care, number one. I got an education about how to better care for this one pair I had. And then I got these other shoes that my feet feel like they're happy feet. They don't want to take these shoes off. And this is good self-care for me. But the way I got to it was observing what I was doing. You hear that, friends? Just watching my own behavior. And I'm just thinking, now, why am I going to this when I've always worn that? And he had to like, go way far away. The one I was going to buy was in like another building. So you see what I'm saying? Observing yourself. Uh makes us better because it helps us listen 
to what we need. So I'm going to just give you a few questions to think about. Um, so really, when we're talking about observer self, we're talking about learning to recognize a certain consciousness that's going on with us, right? What we're doing, why we're doing it. So we want to ask ourselves, you know, what am I thinking? Why am I thinking it? And then, you know, what am I judging? Usually there's a real judging piece that's going on when we're stuck in emotions, that something different should be happening than is, or we should be, you know, different than we are. So I think this will help you because one, it's going to help you um, create some detachment from the situation, which there's a lot of freedom in detaching emotionally from a situation. And by detaching, I don't mean not caring. By detaching, I mean not being controlled by your emotions. And then you become the director of your own movie rather than being, you know, um, well, I feel this and I feel that and I feel this and she did that and that means this and this means that and why do they do that? You see, we're caught up in the drama of life. We're like, uh, we're being directed rather than directing. So I want, I want to make sure that this is making sense. So Dave, if you don't mind, I'm checking in with you to see, um, is this making sense since this is new to you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, I'm letting it kind of, kind of wash, wash over me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just kind of thinking back to things and times in my life where, where I've done that without really kind of knowing I was, I was doing that. I mean, and just, like yes. I said, just as recently as, just this past weekend, you know, when we had everything start going sideways during the yes. live live stream of our annual meeting, you know, we we had to do that, had to kind of kind of kind of step back and th- and then you you can start seeing, you know, blind spots. As a teacher, you know, I'm always mm-hmm. always yes. looking for that. And and I actually solicit feedback from my students on that, and it's an it's an exercise and kind of, you know, being real with yourself, being truthful with yourself and having yes. and and opportunity to see yourself in a new way. And so as as an educator, we're always self-evaluating. And if you're not, then then you're gonna get into some trouble. I and, say and you're I don't not mean, a very good educator. That's right. That's right. Because you yeah. can't you can't know everything and you can't know how things that you have known for decades, you, mm-hmm. it's easy to forget what it's like to not know those things, you know? <laughs> and yes. so we're always self-evaluating. Yes. And and the last piece I want to say it's it's actually a real uh taking this in the final depth of this concept so stay with us friends um typically our reactions are reactions that we've accumulated not only in this lifetime but over many lifetimes and because they're so old and so ingrained the re- you know that's the reason we don't see them they're a part of what I often you'll hear me call the limited self you know, the self that is bound to, to, you know, black and white and up and down and all the opposites. The mystics always call it living in the land of the opposites. But um, first we have to, so, you know, once we know that, you know, that we're acting from the limited self and that really this is keeping us in bondage to the limited self, well, then there becomes the desire, of course, to wake up. Because who would want, I mean, just the sound of that. Yes, I think I'll live in bondage to my limited (laughs) self. You know, it's normal to want to go, oh, no, I don't want to live in these, you know, old reactions. But but again, to break free, you first have to see what's there. And that's what the observer self does. It helps us see what is there so that we can make a new decision. And again, the first times that we do this, it's very, very difficult because we've, you know, quote, always done it this way. You know, and anybody knows in an organization when you say we've always done it this way, you're headed for death. <laughs> That's right. You know, when you when you can't see a new way to move through and to operate, then you know you have to be careful. So, so there there can be then, um, you know, forgiveness pieces to do. Uh, there, uh, I'm working on self forgiveness right now. Uh, in my own walk, I'm doing my seventy times seven, where every single day. I'm writing, I forgive myself totally and completely. And so every day I'm writing that 70 times, and I'm going to do that for a week because I realized um, I need to do some self-forgiveness on some of these behaviors of how I've uh, 
just had this pattern of these internal assaults, and I don't want to do that anymore. And what I'm I'm already noticing is, um, you know, I'm creating this internal support system, and this internal support system then watches over the personality self. So instead of being controlled by it, it's like the personality now is is to be is to serve the spiritual self. So we don't obliterate the personality. What we do is we have it in its proper perspective and we have the the soul of us, you know, uh, guiding and directing our lives. And then the personality is serving this higher self. You know, it, for me to go out and speak, I have to be, I have to have confidence. I have to have clarity. Well, people would say, well, that's from the personality. Yes, it is. But it's tempered with my spiritual self. I don't have so much confidence that I can't be corrected. I don't have so much clarity that I won't hear another viewpoint, but I have to have those aspects. Well, if I have confidence without the spiritual nature, without the observer self, I'm going to get into ego trouble real quick. See, so the personality serves the spiritual self then. The personality is under this observer self and is being guided by your soul. So friends, this is our hope for you. All of our shows ultimately are about becoming conscious beings. We love to say, you know, you're here to grow, prosper, and evolve. You're here to become more conscious. The world needs your conscious, higher self. The world needs your examined life. The world needs your examined life. We started at the beginning with the quote from Socrates. An unexamined life is not worth living. And I... 100% agree with that. So my hope for you is that as you listen to the shows, that you continue to look deeply into your own life and see how you can, you know, rise above the reactions and the the personality stuff of up, down, right, wrong, mad, mad, sad, glad, that there's more to life and that you're, uh, even these emotions that you're feeling are, are there to help you grow or help you, you know, to help you see these places where you're stuck in the limited self and help you move into freedom and live from this higher aspect of you. So this is our prayer for you, friends. And uh, I hope you'll check out on my website some of the many, many classes. You know, in in the month of March, we're doing Soul Evolution and Reincarnation. Uh, April, I'm taking some time. So um, there will be no classes in April. And then I'm starting with um, Four Agreements in May. And uh, I reached out to a friend of mine uh, recently and said, what do Tom Brady and spirituality have in common? And he goes, I have no idea. It's a big Tom Brady fan. He said, I have no idea. I said, the four agreements. Tom Brady has studied the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz for many, many years. And he calls it his blueprint for life. And boy, that book is right from the soul is going to bless us. So uh, we're going to be doing uh, just courses. I'm not going to be doing shows on it, but I'm going to be doing Monday night courses on the book, The Four Agreements as well in May. So we hope uh, we're thrilled that you join us on the podcast and would love to see in some of the courses to take the material even deeper and have you, you know, receive a lot of support from the online community we've been building. Yeah, and we'll have links to all of that, including uh, Track Shack and Jane Elizabeth Hart. And Why I, not? Was able, I was able to find that scrub scene, and we'll have that in our show notes, uh, as well <laughs> cool. as the classes and all of that. So be sure to click on the episode 144 for March 22nd, 2021. Thank you, friends. Blessings on the journey. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Authentic Spiritual Journey, presented by Zen Living Realty, Support Tech Staffing, and Center for the Healing Arts. This channel is also made possible because of listeners just like you. If you would like to support the channel with your tax-deductible contribution on an ongoing basis or through a one-time gift, head over to experienceofthesoul.com slash support. The Authentic Spiritual Journey is copyright 2021, Cynthia Alice Anderson, all rights reserved. Our theme music is composed by Dave Croft and used with permission from RR Hot Publishing. The Experience of the Soul podcast channel is a production of 818 Studios.